I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Michael Tonry, who is the Marvin J. Sanofsky Chair of Law and Public Policy. He is a, a, a person of broad background. Uh, in, the, in 1987, he founded and directed the MacArthur Foundation United States Department of Justice Program on Human Development and Criminal Behavior, has done a series of path-breaking empirical works throughout the country, and also has the, the wonderful benefit to us uh, of having a comparative perspective. He's been involved uh, in uh, thinking about these trends, this change in sentencing law, the increase in incarceration, the increase in racial disparities. He's been studying it since it really began to happen. He's also been studying what's been going on in Europe at the same time in a, in a different system around the world. And I think that uh, in the United States, it's particularly valuable for us to be able to think about what we're doing compared to other countries with a long established system of justice and courts. He's going to try to help pull the day together to think about some of the challenges. Uh, he's intimately familiar with the data that we've talked about today, intimately uh, familiar with policy, has been active with courts and criminal justice and sentencing commissions throughout the United States for decades. And we're, he's going to help us think about how we think about this moment in the United States, uh, how we think about this time when the data is becoming clear, when it is focusing us very clearly on these issues and how we might benefit from thinking about the history of our system and other systems uh, that have a system of, of justice uh, and, and order for a long period of time and how we move forward, what our next steps can be and how we think about these problems and take steps forward. Professor Conrad. Thank you much, Myron. I need to have you return my notes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and now let me just play for a minute. Okay. Well, Kevin Wright said two things that, that I want to uh, build on. The first thing, he, he didn't say in so many words, but it, it, it was part of a colloquy he had with the questioner. And, 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 and what he basically said is that a lot of these issues are ultimately about values, and we need to talk openly about them as questions about values. Racial issues are very difficult to talk about, but if we don't talk about them openly, we're not likely to accomplish very much about them uh, in, 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 in addressing them. The other thing he did was refer to an elderly book of mine. And you may think I've on purpose. There, there's, a, there's an elderly theme here. Myron talked about the tens of decades that I've worked on these subjects. Um, it's, my hair's a little bit of a giveaway. And, and this book cover is a bit elderly. And the reason I mentioned the book cover is that Kevin mentioned this book. And I wanted to tell a little tiny bit of a story about it. So I published this book in about 1992. And, and the aim was to try to get a handle, pardon? 95. 90 <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> so this book came out in 95, but I was working on it in 92. Um, and the aim was, what do we know about racial disparities and their causes and how much of it is related to bias and how much is related to, to the policies we choose and how much was related to different patterns of crime by different groups of people. And the book came out, and, and for an academic, it was really fun, because on the one hand, the Department of Justice organized a couple of conferences of academics and practitioners to talk about it, and that's kind of heady if you're a, a mere academic. And the other one was that Jesse Jackson at the 2000, uh, the 1995 annual meeting of Operation PUSH held it up and waved it and said, this guy's got it pretty much right. And I thought, wow, that's really fun. <coughs> and, and then um, 25 years or 20, what, 20 years later, 18 years later, I did another book. And this book is on exactly the same subject. It talks about other kinds of issues. It's a bit more historical spends a lot more time looking at psychological research on stereotypes and associations and unconscious bias and so on. But in the end, it's, it's about the same thing. Um, 
And, and <clears throat> what's really striking about the comparison between these two books is that with one important exception, nothing has changed in the United States about the extent of racial disparities or the reasons for them. And, and, and I'll, I'm going to document that in this talk. Um, and the one thing that has changed is that they've become vastly worse in absolute terms. The understanding of why they <coughs> exist hasn't changed, the causes haven't changed, the problem has gotten worse. And so in this talk, what I'm going to, the, the theme is, you know, unless we take these issues on directly, head on, without thinking we're going to address them by dealing as, 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 as John Choi suggested, is important, and it is important, by dealing with problems of bias, conscious or unconscious, or by dealing with problems of, 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 of collateral consequences, which are immensely important, and dealing with the disabilities that convicted people have, which are dis uh, immensely important, we're not going to address the problem in any serious way. So here's a little list that I'm going to run through. If we really wanted to reduce racial disparities in the United States, there are four things we have to do. These are the causes of racial disparities in the United States. The first cause of racial disparities in the United States is Conscious policy decisions of legislators and police and to a much, much lesser extent judges and prosecutors. And unless we address those policy decisions, we're not going to affect the problem. The second thing we have to do is a subcategory. Unless we alter in this country the continuing emphasis of giving primacy strategically to street level drug arrests in disorganized urban neighborhoods. We're not going to significantly reduce racial disparities in the American criminal justice system. If we don't reduce racial profiling by the police, we're not going to significantly reduce racial disparities. When we talk about racial profiling, people are mostly concerned about the sheer unfairness of police without adequate cause stopping people partly on the basis of their ethnicity. And that's a big problem. But the bigger problem is that if we stop 10 times more blacks and Hispanics relative to whites, and even if, we're, if the police are just as good in their guesses with blacks, Hispanics, and whites, if we stop 10 times more Hispanics and whites and 8% of them get arrested, whites, blacks, and Hispanics, in absolute terms, the number of people going into the police department and the courts who are black and Hispanic is going to be eight times higher than the number of white people. It's a huge feeder of the system. And the last is Richard, Richard Fraser's point about, about criminal record. I'm going to do this in 12 minutes, so we'll be five minutes late is all. Um, so I'm going to run you through some things. This, this table, I don't really expect you to absorb. I show it to you. <laughs> now, I show it to you only to show that I've actually done the calculations that are in it. What I wanted to do with this table was show you why addressing issues like bias, conscious or unconscious, <coughs> or collateral consequences is not seriously going to affect the problem of racial disparities. And what I did, but I'll show it later in a shorter one that's easier, is I just took the year 2006, took the then existing black and white imprisonment rates per 100,000 people, which was a difference of five and a half to one, and I used a large estimate, a large estimate of what the effects would be if we could just get all the conscious and unconscious bias out of the system. If we could reduce disparity by 10% because that was the amount of disparity that was affected by conscious and unconscious bias and didn't do anything else, right? We would reduce the amount of disparity a bit from five and a half to one, to five to one, but we would still wind up with 
2,400 black people per 100,000 in prison, a huge absolute number. If we were much more radical and reduced the use of imprisonment in the United States by half overall, so we halved these rates of imprisonment in 2006, we'd keep the same ratio of racial disparities, but we would cut the number of black people in prison to 1,330 per 100,000. And if we rolled back, and this is not radical, if we rolled back to 1980, when the American imprisonment rate was about 300, three times the world average, and just used the numbers as they existed then, the number of black people in prison per 100,000 would be 827. Now, th this may seem an odd thing for me to talk about, and I'm in this next, whoops, in this next figure, I've just reduced it again. I just want to repeat the numbers again really quickly. If we were seriously trying to reduce the bite that prison takes out of the lives of black Americans, if we invest our energy in trying to reduce racial disparities resulting from conscious and unconscious bias, we could do it a little, but we would still wind up with almost 2,500 black people per 100,000 in prison a tiny, tiny reduction in the bite that prison takes. If we did these other things, we could reduce the, the, the effects of imprisonment, the number of people suffering collateral consequences, the number of people suffering disabilities as a, regard, as a result of felony convictions in half. So if, if we're really going to seriously address the problem of racial disparities, we've got to think big. And if we think big, we've got to talk about these words that, 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 that liberal reformers have been uncomfortable talking about for a long time. Words like justice and equality and humanity and human rights. In many fields today, liberal reformers typically talk about cost effectiveness and recidivism reduction and we're going to deliver this program at slightly less cost than prison and isn't that wonderful? That is not why current policies were adopted, right? The current policies in the U.S. that drive racial disparities were not adopted because legislatures throughout the United States did cost-effectiveness studies and decided, well, you know, prison is more cost-effective <laughs> than not. They didn't do that. They did it because they thought victims deserve vindication, bad people deserve being pummeled. They did it for normative reasons. And so to try to respond to, to patterns and policies that exist and were created for normative reasons on the basis of we'll save a little money here, and if we're right that this program works, but usually we're not going to be right, in general correctional programs do not reduce recidivism rates, closely monitored ones run by charismatic leaders with adequate resources and wonderful staff training do. Ordinary programs don't. <clears throat> we're going to be making promises we can't keep and we're not going to be speaking in the terms of the people who enacted the laws that produced the patterns that we're unhappy with. All right, so, so my four points, and I'll only talk about three of them. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. Okay, this is, this is quick, you know this. So here's what happened with imprisonment in the United States. If you go back to the 1960s, the, the number, fraction of people in prison who are black is about a third. And it goes up a little bit until the beginning of the Reagan administration, when it reaches the mid 40s, goes up in above 50%. And when I say 50% black, I mean 50% black people. <coughs> Hispanic, non-Hispanic, people who have dark skin tones, who got classified by the police and, and in those days by prison systems. So half the people in America who were in prison were black. And that hasn't changed very much at all in the last 10 years. So when I wrote my first book, it's right here, right? And I'm analyzing all the problems and, 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 all the, and, and, and looking at the effects of crime by group, on, on arrest and imprisonment and, and, and prison and so on, and identifying what the problems were, no change. So there's no change at all of any consequence in the scale of racial disparities. This makes it more vivid. What I did here, I've never seen anybody else do this before, I put the rates per 100,000 black people and white people in prison in given years <coughs> on the same graph 
in a way that dramatically emphasizes the blackness of American prison policy. So if you go back to 1950, there were about 100 whites per 100,000 in prison over here and about 700 blacks. If you look at this curve, 1,000, 1,400, 1,800, 2,000, 2,600, 2,800. The amount of increase in imprisonment of black people, go back to when I said that in, in 1980 when the Reagan administration took power and we had the first big jump up to about 46% of, of American prisoners being black. Look at the difference between the imprisonment rate for blacks then of 1,200 per 100,000 and now, when it pushes 3,000. So the problem is much, much worse. And I want to give you one last little figure of this sort that a little bit <laughs> brings in an element I hadn't actually planned to talk to, but, my, but Myron, Myron raised it, so I'll say something about it, which is the comparative work that I do. I do a lot of work in other countries, both as an academic and as an advisor to governments. In Western countries, Europe, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, developed, wealthy Western countries, it is indeed true that the imprisonment rate per 100,000, the imprisonment rate for the entire population, including people in jail and people convicted, is about 100 per 100,000, ranging from in the 60s in the Scandinavian countries <coughs> to 140 or 50 in England and Spain, which are the, are the high countries. In this figure, what I show is the increase per year in imprisonment rates for whites and blacks in the United States for a 20-year period. So look over here at this year, 1991. In 1991, I'm making this number up. If the black imprisonment rate was 2,000, 2000 in 1991, at the end of 1991, it was 2,126, another 126 black Americans per 100,000 went to prison as an additional increment. The population of the prison <coughs> increased by 126 black people per 100,000. That's more than the total imprisonment rate of any except two or three Western countries today. And that was just one year. If you look at these, these little bars, there were 10 years during the Clinton era and at least in the first few years, he, he purported to be a progressive on social policy issues. There were 10 years in the Clinton era when the imprisonment rate for blacks increased per year more than the average of any other developed, well, most of the developed countries in the world. All right. <coughs> so that was point one. The problem is not getting better. And it's only going to get much better if we do things that we figure out ways by taking on the really hardest questions and driving down the use of imprisonment in this country. Second thing was drugs. I'm going to show you three sets of drug figures. This one is, is, is from the National, used to call the National Drug Abuse Annual Surveys of Self-Reported Drug Use. And what it I took, showed you two years just to show you that the, one wasn't a fluke. They show for alcohol, look at this, more whites than blacks drink alcohol ever last year or last month. Any illicit drug, same pattern. More blacks than whites use any illicit drug. Marijuana, all these measures, except right down here at the bottom. More whites than blacks use marijuana. Cocaine, many more whites than blacks use cocaine. The only exception is way down here at the bottom, and it deals with crack cocaine. But in general and overall, black people in America use drugs significantly less than white people do. Now look at this. this and we know that the prevalence of drug trafficking within racial groups is the same. And I'm going to show you something in a minute that, that demonstrates this. So Americans use drugs at about the same rate, except whites do more, except for crack, but the crack levels are very, very low. <coughs> <coughs> But when we arrest people, this is the war on drugs taken off. The rate at which we arrest white people, this is all people we arrest, adults and kids, has been about the same, 200 per 100,000 for the last, what do I have here? I have 
But look at the black rate. At its peak, it was six times higher than the white rate. Now it's a mere four times higher than the white rate. So blacks don't use drugs anymore, and all the evidence we have about trafficking is that blacks don't sell drugs anymore, uh, but blacks certainly get arrested a lot more, and in the last 10 years, drug, drug offenses have been a primary driver of <coughs> prison population increase, especially in respect to state prisons. Okay. And yet, we arrest all these people. How do we do that? Well, you know why? We know how we do that. It's because police emphasize street-level drug <coughs> enforcement in socially disorganized urban areas. That's why. That's how come. So the police put out a net, and not surprisingly, they pull in an awful lot of minority drug fish. If that's not a... Maybe, maybe I shouldn't go there. That's, we'll forget that. But, um, so this is, this is drug sales by young people, right? The same self-reported sort of data. And Richard, Richard Fraze has worked with this stuff a lot. And all I want to point out is 12 to 17 year olds sold drugs at least once in the last year. Solid line is black, white lines is white. This is the same national drug abuse stuff. What you see is that three to four percent of kids say they sold drugs to somebody in the preceding year. Black. Yeah, it kind of wobbles whether it's slightly higher or black or slightly higher part, but it's, it's 10 years of data in very, very large surveys. Look at the number of kids who say they've sold drugs at least 10 times. So these are kids who are sort of doing it as a, at least as a source of serious pocket money. Same, same. Now look at this. These are arrest rates for kids for drug events. Until the late 1970s, the white rate was higher. And that's because a lot of white kids got arrested for selling marijuana at a time when the drug wars emphasized marijuana. But there was a political reaction to that because middle class parents, white or black or Hispanic, didn't like their kids getting criminal records and, 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 and occupational disabilities and so on. And so most, most states changed. But look at what happened to the black kids. Up and up and up and up. So, these, these are all products of police decisions about how to allocate resources and legislative decisions about how to punish the offenses that the police are pulling in. Unless you can address both of those problems, you know, if, if the chances that a black kid sells drugs is the same as of a white kid, but a black kid is ten times more likely to get arrested, and if that sale of drugs is going to expose that kid to a two or a five or a ten or a twenty year mandatory minimum sentence, big surprise that we have huge disparities in prison. We'll skip that one. So I started out saying there are four things we need to do, and we need to think big, and we need to talk about values, and explaining why we need to do it. Radically, oops, radically reduce the prison population. You know, it's, it's three times worse than it was when I wrote that first book. If you think not in terms of statistics, but think in terms of real human beings whose lives are affected, three times more black Americans than Hispanics, and white Americans too. I mean, white Americans are also, their numbers are going up too, but, but they don't suffer the extreme disparities. Street level drug enforcement, the last two things I've already talked about, reduce racial profiling. I, I just make the point that I made at the beginning this is New York City data on 48, no, 42 months of police stops in New York City for <coughs> street stops. Turns out that in New York City for these three years, whoops, turns out that 44% of the population is non-white Hispanic, but there are 10% of the people stopped. Blacks are a quarter of the population, but they're half of the people stopped. Hispanics are 28% and they're 30% of those stops, so that pretty much breaks out. But look at this. So the proportion of whites who were stopped by the police is 2.2% on, on a population basis for New York. 2.2% of whites are stopped by the police on the street. 17.6% of blacks are. That's eight times higher. So just do the simple math. There are roughly twice as many 
whites as blacks in New York City, blacks are stopped eight times more often in absolute numbers. The police are yielding four times more black people who've been picked up for one reason or another. And they're going through the system. And finally, there's Richard Sparks, I think, breathtakingly important finding, because this is an easy, quick fix. The finding that the primary driver of prison disparities in Minnesota <coughs> is the way the Minnesota sentencing guidelines and its profound lack of wisdom 30 years ago chose to deal with criminal history. If your sentence doubles or triples this time because you had a prior conviction or two, and black people are more likely to get arrested and convicted for these things, especially drug crimes, then big surprise that 63%, according to Richard's analysis, 63%, that's an average for nine years. I, I asked him about this before, before I spoke. It isn't just one year's data. It's taking nine years of Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Two-thirds of the disparity results from a low-visibility, non-statutory policy decision by nine people sitting around in a room, probably kind of like this, how much are we increased penalties because somebody had a prior conviction? Oh, I'd say double it. All right, we'll double it. That's sheer craziness. So if Minnesota or any American jurisdiction wants significantly to reduce racial disparities and the damage they do to human lives, got to think big got to think big. It's really important to deal with things like disabilities resulting from felonies in your record. We've got to attack all that stuff, of course. But, but that's really operating at the tiniest retail level. These are big wholesale problems, and retail solutions probably aren't going to fix them. So, I'm not sure whether I was supposed to inspire or give, <laughs> give marching orders or give a sermon or what I was supposed to do. Uh, but anyway, so this funny juxtaposition between doing this book that has, has the Department of Justice on one hand and Jesse Jackson on the other saying, good boy, good man, you did a good job there. That's really important. You showed us what's wrong. And then to look at it again 20 years later and discover that all the policies that caused the problems in 1992 remain in place, but the absolute problem, the relative problem is exactly the same. And the absolute problem is three or four times bigger. It seems to me those ought to be marching. <laughs> there ought to be flags that we can all march behind, that, that we've got to figure out a way to, to, to do more that is just in the way we deal with criminal offenders. Thank you. U.S. compares to other countries, and are there other countries that are <coughs> doing better that we can model? Are there other models well, in other countries? The imprisonment rate, as I said at the beginning, the young man from the, from the council pointed out that the American prison rate is 800 per 100,000. <coughs> The, the, uh, Senator Limmer said, well, you know, a lot of these problems don't apply to Minnesota because we have a small imprisonment rate, second lowest in the country. But when you add the Minnesota prison population rate to the Minnesota juvenile confinement rate to the juvenile pretrial rate and county, county sentence rate, the, the Minnesota, I don't know what this is, Richard, you may know, is it 350, 300 when you put it all together? All right, so 300 per 100,000 people in, quote, liberal Minnesota is five times higher than the Scandinavian countries. It is three and a half times higher than Germany, Italy, France. It is two and a half, two times higher than the highest other countries in the Western world, which are England and Spain and New Zealand. So the answer is, in absolute terms, the huge difference is not how often we use prison. 
Oddly enough, Americans do not, American judges do not send more people to prison relative to the number of cases coming through than judges in some other countries. We just send them there for breathtakingly long times. So if, if, if we're in Scandinavia or Germany, the number, the percentage of sentences that are for more than one year is in the one or two percent range. In most other developed countries, the maximum authorized sentence that can be imposed, except sometimes, <coughs> sometimes for aggravated murder. But with that setting that aside, in most other countries, the maximum sentence that can be imposed is 12 years or 14 years for the most serious of all offenses. We have 52,000 people serving sentences of life without possibility of parole, a significant minority of whom did not commit homicidal offenses, did not commit... Hom so, so the really huge difference between the U.S. and other countries that feeds this absolute difference in imprisonment rate is that we are unprecedentedly severe in this country in the way we treat offenders. Thank you, Professor. All right, the day is over. I want to thank you all again for being a part of the forum and to remind you to fill out those green forms. Those are input forms. And the Council on Crime and Justice with the Institute on Race and Poverty will be producing a report from today. And your input is very much so needed in that. So thank you so much.